The Queen's flight from King's Landing brought no peace to the city or its people. Three false and petty kings reigned over the city, each on his own hill. Yet for their unfortunate subjects there was no law, no justice, no protection. No man's home was safe, nor any maiden's virtue. This chaos endured for more than a moon's turn as the city became a lawless hell. Maesters and other scholars writing of this time often take their cue from Grand Maester Munkin's version of events and speak of the moon of the three kings. But for the people of King's Landing, it will forever be known as the moon of madness. But in reality, the idea of three kings is a misnomer, as the shepherd never claimed kingship, styling himself a simple son of the seven. Yet it cannot be denied that he held sway over tens of thousands from the ruins of the dragon pit and acted very much like a king of sorts. The heads of the five dragons that his followers had slain had been set up on posts, and every night the shepherd would appear amongst them to preach. With the dragons dead and the threat of immolation no longer imminent, the prophet turned his wrath upon the highborn and wealthy. Only the poor and humble would ever see the halls of the gods, he declared. Lords and knights and rich men would be cast down, their pride and avarice to hell. Cast off your silks and satins, and clothe your nakedness in rough spun robes, he told his followers. Throw away your shoes, and walk barefoot through the world, as the Father made you. Thousands obeyed, but thousands more turned away, and the crowd that came to hear the prophet preach grew smaller and smaller, and what was once a fever pitch began to simmer. At the other end of the Street of the Sisters, Game and Powhair's queer kingdom blossomed atop Vesenia's hill. The court of this four-year-old bastard king was made up of whores, mummers and thieves, whilst gangs of ruffians, sellswords and drunkards defended his rule. One decree after another came down from the House of Kisses, where the child king had his seat, each more outrageous than the last. Gaiman decreed that girls should henceforth be equal with boys in matters of inheritance, that the poor be given bread and beer in times of famine, that men who had lost limbs in war must afterwards be fed and housed by whichever lord they had been fighting for when the loss took place. Gaiman decreed that husbands who beat their wives should themselves be beaten, irrespective of what the wife had done to warrant such chastisement. These edicts were almost certainly the work of a Dornish whore named Sylvania Sand reputedly the paramour of the little king's mother, Essie, if Mushroom's tale is to be believed. But despite the boy king's tenuous claim of kingship, his edicts did prove popular with the small folk. Royal decrees also issued forth from atop Aegon's high hill, where Sir Perkin's cat's paw Tristain sat upon the Iron Throne, but those were of a very different nature. The squire king began repealing Queen Rhaenyra's unpopular taxes and dividing the coin in the royal treasury amongst his own followers. He followed that with a general cancellation of debt, raised three score of his gutter knights to the ranks of the nobility and answered King Gaiman's promise of free bread and beer for those starving by granting the poor the right to take rabbits, hares and deer from the kingswood although they were not to touch the elk or boar. All the while, Sir Perkin the Flea was recruiting scores of surviving gold cloaks to Tristane's banner. With their swords, he took control of the Dragon Gate, the King's Gate and the Lion's Gate, giving him four of the city's seven gates and more than half of the towers along its walls. In the early days after the Queen's flight, the Shepherd was by far the most powerful of the city's three kings. But as the nights passed, the number of followers continued to dwindle. The small folk of the city woke as if from a bad dream, Septon Eustace wrote, and like the sinners waking cold and sober after a night of drunken debauchery and revel, they turned away in shame, hiding their faces from one another and hoping to forget. The dragons were dead and the queen fled. Such was the power of the Iron Throne that these commons still looked to the Red Keep when hungry or afraid. So as the power of the shepherd waned on the Hill of Rainies, the power of King Tristane Truefire, as he now styled himself, waxed upon Aegon's high hill.